Hey, I'm Folygon, and in this video I'm going to be sculpting this Disney-inspired veterinarian based on the artwork of Cuddly Beetles. If you are new around here, click that subscribe button and check out the links in the description for my custom brushes, my online courses, and more. The power of editing is a magical thing here when it comes to art time lapses on YouTube. I always think it's really fun and interesting to see these kinds of processes come together in a relatively short amount of time. This video being roughly around 20 minutes, showing the entire process of a digital 3D character that took over 11 hours to create. As I continue forward, you will see a lot of cuts and edits and jumps of things happening very, very quickly, but it took a long time to build these shapes up. And through the magic of editing, we can skip ahead and do some amazing things like what you just saw on screen. This early part of the process is called the block out. It is the part where you build up the foundation of your form. And you saw me creating a lot of really simple brush strokes on my sphere uh, that kind of looked uh, a little childish, right? Some simple lines for some eyes, a simple line for a mouth, just kind of marking up those facial features. Well, that is a very important part of the process. It is necessary to find those landmarks early on so that you can continue forward to a more refined block out like what I have on screen right now. This part of the process is still extremely early in development. I typically get to about this stage, maybe about 30 minutes to one hour into my sculpt. And I try to get to this part or to this stage as quickly as I can. Now that doesn't mean that I'm rushing forward, but I'm, you know, moving methodically, kind of thinking about what I'm doing. Uh, this part of the process is so incredibly important to everything else because everything you do moving forward from here builds on top of what you've already created. And if your foundation is not solid, well, nothing you put on top of that is going to be any good. So I have a lot of these hard lines that don't really appear in my 2D illustration, in my reference. And these are what I consider to be kind of foundational lines, what I call plane changes. These are areas where the form changes direction. You can see these hard lines that I have on the neck and on the sides of the face and the forehead that will eventually go away but they serve as landmarks for me to go back over them and slowly smooth and soften and round them out. I use tools like the trim brush here. I have a custom trim brush, of course, but you can get away with using the default tools in ZBrush or whatever sculpting application you're using, whether that be digital or even real life. Uh, I just use a tool that helps to flatten the surface and kind of blend those edges. I very slowly continue to build up these forms, being careful not to destroy what I've already created. It's very easy during a refinement stage to go from something that is hard and blocky, that just kind of captures the general idea of something, to moving into an organic state while messing up what you've already made. We've made these landmarks that kind of match with our silhouette for our 2D reference, but as we continue forward and smooth out those forms, it can be a very destructive process. So I move forward slowly and carefully on those areas, blending them methodically, taking my time, and making sure that they develop in an organic way. But when I start sculpting something, like you saw with my hair, I start rough, I start fast, because I'm just trying to get something on my canvas. I'm not worried about it looking perfect right away, because I know that very rarely does it look perfect right away. It typically looks bad. It typically looks very bad and awkward and strange right away. And that is something that I have gotten very used to with sculpture. Digital sculpting is so fast compared to a traditional medium, and because of that, and I think also a little bit because of social media and time lapses like what I'm showing you right now, we expect results a lot faster. 
we might have this inflated perception of how quickly these things can come together. I will be the first to tell you that that is not the case. This is something that definitely takes a long time to create. So early on when I'm making hair, eyebrows, a tongue, teeth, eyelashes, whatever it is, I just do it roughly and quickly and I'm not really worried about what it looks like. I just want something there so that I can compare it against my reference. You can't really work on proportions until you really have something to compare it against. If you're taking so much time early on to get everything absolutely perfect, you're going to progress extremely slowly. Once you get there, you can make lots of little changes that slowly add up into big changes. You are watching this footage at 6 times speed, so it is sped up 600% of the original recording. And even with that speed, I think it's kind of difficult to see some of the major changes occur on this character. Because it builds up slowly, it's kind of hard to notice when these big changes start to happen. And this is even more true when you are deep in the polys, when you are sculpting and creating your artwork. It's kind of hard to see your own progress take shape. Which is why I save in versions when I'm working on my 3D models. So that I can not only have, you know, a backup if something goes horribly wrong, but I can also have the ability to compare my past work and progress that I've made compared to where I am now. Because it is very hard to see your own progress, not just on a singular project, but over multiple projects in a long span of time. I've recently started learning how to draw and paint, and it's been a really fun hobby for me. I've had a lot of trouble seeing my own progress happen, but I know if I take the time to just take a few minutes and look back at where I once was, and where I've come to now, and what I'm capable of now compared to then, it's a really cool feeling to be able to see those big differences. And sometimes they're not big differences, sometimes they are rather small little changes that kind of build up slowly. But um, you know, you gotta keep in mind that it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's something that I try to keep in mind for all things in life, not just art, um, but all skills that I am trying to improve upon, whether that be work, school, you know, athletics, whatever. You've seen me move forward here on the character's glasses a little bit. I've started to create some of the clothing now, uh, working on that collar. You know, I've roughed in some simple hair. All of these little rough pieces of geometry. Obviously, uh, very unrefined, very messy, but they just kind of serve like I did as the, uh, the earlier block out for the face. They kind of serve the same purpose here. They are just kind of early placeholders that I can get on the screen to kind of compare proportions and make sure things are lining up and working appropriately. Right now, if you just did an objective comparison between the character that I have on screen and the reference, you would say it, you know, it doesn't really look like the character, right? The bare bones are there, uh, the color palette's there, the different features are there, the hair obviously doesn't look like the character, but you know, all the rough parts and pieces are there, and that's what I really aim to do early on. Any point of this process, you could hit pause and, you know, point out a million different things that are incorrect, but that's exactly what the problem is, that there are a million different things that need to happen, and you can't rush any of this. You can't just speed through this process and get it to look exactly like your reference. You can catch that general feeling rather quickly, like I've done here, but it's going to take a lot of little tweaks over a long period of time to build this up into the more refined version that you are starting to see here on screen. Hair is always something that I get a lot of questions about. I will actually most likely be creating a hair tutorial for my next tutorial on Patreon. I have a strong feeling that that will be the case. Uh, my last one being an in-depth tutorial on clothing and accessories. It was a two-hour real-time uh, tutorial on all the different processes for that, including things like folds, which you just saw me sculpting. But hair is such a 
such a difficult thing to even really talk about. There are so many different processes for going through and creating 3D hair. I could name three off the top of my head for hair cards, sculptural hair, or any kind of simulated curves. My preferred method is sculpting hair, of which even in that category alone there are many processes to go through. What I like to do, or at least what I've done here with this character, it really kind of depends on the hairstyle that I'm trying to create. I've created a base form blockout for my hair structure, which serves multiple purposes. The first being that it helps me kind of gauge the proportions of my head, my hair, my entire character, and everything else but it also gives me a nice starting point to create my individual hair chunks on top of. And then methodically go back over and create a different chunk of hair one at a time. I am just using a default brush called the Curve Tube Brush, uh, which comes with every installation of ZBrush. And then I'm using a couple settings to create some taper for those forms. Then I'm going rather methodically, as I've said, over top of that larger chunk of hair, creating these individualistic pieces, and I'm using my reference to kind of gauge where those are, how many there should be. I try to keep it a little more simple for the back of the head, simply because it's not really the focal point of this character, obviously. I don't want you to be spending a ton of time looking at the back of his head. I'd rather have that focus and attention be more so on the face, on the front, on the more interesting part that I spent a lot more work on. So I keep the back rather simple, I use less chunks of hair. Uh, for the front though, I try to keep it as close to the reference as I can, but there were definitely some parts that either didn't make sense to me or didn't really make sense in 3D. Uh, if I can't really make sense of something, I try to just figure out a creative solution to get it to look as close as possible. Oftentimes there are many parts like this in a 2D illustration where some different forms don't necessarily translate to 3D all too well or really make that much sense. A really good example of one of those forms is if you look at the back of the character's head, the reference that is, there are these two little fronds of hair that kind of shoot out in the back of the head, a little bit like a pair of leaves, a little sprout back there. And in 3D, trying to get that to work, I, I did try to do this and I came up with something that looks a little close to it and it'll be refined and changed over time. But um, getting that, you know, silhouette to read exactly the same just simply wasn't working. So I played around with it and got something as close as I could. And that is just one example, actually a very small, simple example of many. There are much more complex examples here with the hair alone. Uh, with the face, with the way that the form revolves around for the cheeks, with the perspective of the character's body versus the perspective of the face. There's a much more wide camera lens being used on the face than on the body. Uh, for example, you know, it's a little tough to explain, but if you know anything about how cameras work, the wider camera lens that you have, the wider focal length that you have, the kind of less perspective you have on that. And then with a really short focal length or really short lens, it creates a really strong or deep perspective effect. So with the character's body, at least in the reference, it is tapering off into the distance rather quickly, making that further shoulder look much smaller than its closer counterpart. Whereas with the face, we see a lot less of that perspective warping, and with the hair as well. So that is, you know, another example of some things that get very difficult and frustrating to work with in 3D. Um, there are many of them though, many different things that can kind of happen here in terms of problem areas. Much like with my character's face or clothing, after I generally block out the major form for my hair, I like to go back over top of that and add some secondary forms to them. I wouldn't necessarily call this any kind of extreme detail, but I'm just going back through carving in some secondary forms, giving the hair overall some more visual complexity. And you don't really need to go hyper complex with these. You don't need to have a ton of these different strands of hair. These uh, forms are rather simple, but by having many of these kind of flow and blend together, it begins to build up into this more complex shape. 
that slowly over time reads as hair when you combine it all together. But when you look at just a singular chunk by itself, you're like, oh, that's just kind of a, a weird tube shape. And yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. But so many things on your character are weird tube shapes that you probably don't think about. Think about your neck. It's a weird tube. I'm now moving forward into the stage of polish. This is when I take everything that I've already created and I go back through and make sure it is as good as possible. You can do this multiple times. I mean, honestly, you can do this an infinite number of times, but I wouldn't recommend it. You'll never ever finish your work. So I, uh, you know, it's hard to know when to call something quits when you're working on it, when you are your own art director, because you can always make something better, or at least you feel like you can. But you will eventually push into a point where you are receiving what is called diminishing returns. This general idea is that you are definitely improving things, you are making changes, but they are so small and minuscule that you yourself can barely even notice the changes that you are making. That is the point at which you should probably call it quits and move on to something else. But for me right now, there's still a lot that I can do. I've added some shading to the clothing. I don't typically like to do a lot of hand painted shadows as they can come across really harsh in a final render. So if I do any kind of that effect, I will typically downplay it pretty hard. On characters' faces, I don't really like to do it at all, like underneath the neck there's a really strong shadow. I prefer to just let the lighting in my final render do most of that work for me. Little details to the buttons on the clothing, little tiny stray strands of hair, little details to the chain link for the glasses. I forget what those are called, but they keep you from, uh, I guess, losing your glasses if you drop them. I think I had some of those on a pair of sunglasses when I was a kid. Little details like painting, the bow tie, um, more tiny little tweaks to the teeth, to the eyes, to the eyelashes, the eyebrows, anything that I feel like I can push a little further is done at this stage of the process. In terms of asymmetry on this character, I keep this effect extremely subtle. I did not think that the expression and face of the 2D reference was all that asymmetrical, so I don't want to unnecessarily apply that to my 3D character. There are some places and occasional times where you can push and improve on a 3D work over a 2D reference, and anytime I have the opportunity for something like that, I push on that as much as I can. But you don't want to unnecessarily add something to, you know, a character or whatever you're working on when it's not really present in your reference. A really good example of that is over modeling anatomical form. I'm not going to sit here and give this guy like massive muscles on his body, uh, even though it's, you know, a very simple form and I wouldn't have the clothing fit really tight to that because it's simply not present in the reference. For my finishing touches here on the character, I go back over everything and do a little bit of some color correction. I often have a bad habit of selecting some base colors for some objects and then kind of sticking with them for the rest of my entire character creation. And then by the end of it, sometimes I'll have a few things that are just way off. So this is me going back over top of some of that now and just correcting as much as I can. And here is the finished character in ZBrush. So this is before the render. This is just a quick turnaround movie. It's very simple to do in your movie palette. And here is also the character split up into its groups. I always see these for character blockouts and I always think they're just kind of really fun to look at. It's just a really nice way to see how things are split up. And here is a quick turntable render from Blender. The quality of this is a little bit low because it takes a long time to render every single frame, but for the final rendered image, which you can see here, I spent uh, a lot you know, more samples, a lot more time rendering this out to make sure it's as high quality as I possibly can. 
uh, showing off some of the different sections there, the eyes, the clothes, the hair, everything there for our final Disney-inspired veterinarian character. Well, hey, I hope you enjoyed the process. Again, a huge shout out to Cuddly Beetles for the inspiring artwork. If you enjoyed the process, click that like button, click subscribe if you are new around here, and check out the links down in the description for my custom brushes, tutorials, online courses, and more. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.